All right, good afternoon, everyone. How did Dr. Silverstein do last time, all right? Awesome. He did better, yeah? Awesome, great. Recorded it properly. And Perfect. Perfect execution. All right, you got it. You did well. <laughs> so from Dr. Silverstein, you heard all about infections that go on for long periods of time, the so-called persistent infections. So today we're going to talk about quicker ones, the acute infections. So here I think is a slide that you saw already illustrating a few different general patterns of infection. You have inf on the bottom three different kinds of infection that last a long time. Persistent infections with different patterns of virus production, episodes of disease or death. But today I want to talk about the infections characterized by the graph on the top here, the acute infections. These are typically rhinovirus, influenza, rotaviruses, measles, infections that are relatively quick, but more importantly, more important than the time, because quick to you means something different than it means to me, infections that get resolved um, and they, they're over. They don't last for on and on. So these are typically brief. But again, brief has a large window, as you'll see. Um, the cells, the infection is in eliminated within days or sometimes weeks or a little bit longer. Most of them are very short. You usually get one infection, usually, um, and therefore vaccination against these kinds of uh, acute infections is possible. The agents that cause acute infections is possible. Uh, but again, there are exceptions, as we will talk about a bit later. Uh, and if you um, aren't healthy, or even if you are healthy, some acute infections can really overwhelm uh, your immune system, like zoonotic infections, viruses that go from animals to people that are not well adapted to people, they don't get along well with people, they can cause a lot of death. So here's the course of a typical acute infection. Uh, you get the virus comes into you. We've talked a lot, of course, about how the virus uh, would get into you in this course. Uh, it begins to multiply. If it is not contained by the innate uh, defenses, which kick in right away, goes above a certain threshold that, that kicks in the adaptive response. Uh, and then virus in this graph continues to increase in number. The adaptive response is kicking in. Uh, and eventually, if you're lucky, it's controlled by the adaptive response. The uh, virus goes down. And it's eventually cleared. You have your symptoms of the infection. You get well. And then you have memory. So that if you're infected again, you can have a more rapid response to even prevent infection. So here we, we didn't prevent infection. The immune response was slow, too slow to do that. But the next time it should be prevented as long as you get infected with the same pathogen. We often talk about an incubation period. This actually will go for any kind of virus infection, even a persistent one. But it's most relevant today. The incubation period is the initial time before symptoms are obvious, before you start sniffling or uh, have a muscle ache or whatever the symptoms of the disease are. That's the incubation period. During that time, the genome is replicating. The virus has infected cell. It's replicating. Uh, you're making cytokines. And eventually, those cytokines will produce some symptoms, some nonspecific symptoms, which are the what we call the prodromal symptoms. That is, the, the general symptoms of a virus infection that happened before the very specific ones. So for measles, the specific symptoms are the rash. But before you get that, you get fever and aches and, and that sort of nonspecific. And those are called prodromal. So we're producing cytokines with a global effect. And that gives you these nonspecific symptoms. Incubation periods can vary from a few days to a long time. Uh, years, well, HIV is a 10-year incubation period, but I wouldn't consider it to be an acute infection. All right? But this is just a general incubation period slide. So some incubation periods can be very long. Because remember, that means just the time before it takes before you get specific symptoms. So we're going to have a, an entire lecture about HIV infection, and you will see that there's actually a little period of disease followed by many years of no disease and then disease again. So when um, in the 
uh, not, all, all the different incubation periods vary from short to longer. The short ones typically mean that the virus comes in, replicates at the site of entry, and causes its disease right there, like a respiratory infection, rhinovirus or influenza virus. Uh, the virus replicates at the site of entry, and so the, the incubation period is short because that's where the disease is caused, right where the virus is coming in. Uh, there are the, in general, the virus infections with longer incubation periods means that the virus has to get in somewhere and then go somewhere else. So measles is a good example. It gets in the respiratory tract, but then the rash, the virus has to make its way to the skin. And to do that, it has to do a couple of viremias, so it takes longer uh, to do that. Of course, there are always exceptions, but those are two generalizations that are uh, often followed. So here are some incubation periods. Notice the, t the title is of some common viral infections. Uh, and, and they vary from 1 to 2 days, 5 to 7, 5 to 20, 12 to 14 days, 30 to 50, 50 to 150 days for hepatitis, rabies, uh, and a papillomavirus, the, the uh, induction of warts. 50 to 150 days, a half a year it can take. Uh, and then we have AIDS, which is 1 to 10 years. So I don't think AIDS is an acute infection because um, it, t it lasts that long. During that period, the virus is replicating, but that's debatable. But uh, many of these others are acute infections, and you can see there's quite a range uh, of incubation period. Mostly what we will talk about are these very short incubation period infections. Now, we have talked before about what we call inapparent infections. And today we're going to talk about inapparent acute infections. And these are successful infections. That is, the virus gets in and it replicates. But there are no symptoms. All right. Um, so virus gets in. It can replicate. It can spread within you. And uh, it doesn't cause any obvious symptoms. So you have no idea that you've been infected. But if you were to take serum or have serum taken and look for specific antibodies to the virus, you would find them. And that's how we know that there are inapparent infections because when there are outbreaks of, of diseases, so in the heyday of polio in this country, we used to sample many individuals and we found that in fact many people seroconverted, right? they developed antibodies to the virus, but they never were ill. So those are inapparent infections. And well-adapted pathogens uh, often follow this pattern. Not all of them, but uh, many well-adapted pathogens give a lot of inapparent infections. They have adapted or evolved to replicate without causing extensive disease. For example, no, over 90% of polio infections are inapparent, and many uh, infections with West Nile are inapparent as well. Now, these, are, these acute infections are uh, important public health problems, which is not to say that persistent infections are not, as you heard last time. But these are for a different reason. These uh, acute infections are associated with these outbreaks of disease that, that affect many people. Polio, before we almost eradicated it, used to affect many, many people every year. Influenza still does, measles. Um, uh, acute infections are often uh, zoonotic infections where virus goes from an animal to a human. So the movie Contagion is about a zoonotic infection, a virus that goes from an animal to a human, Ebola viruses, Nipah, Hendra. Uh, eventually, every virus that we know about came from an animal at some time. Uh, but if it happens in real time while we're watching, we call it a zoonotic infection. These acute infections have particularly thorny problems for people who are working in public health, uh, doctors, epidemiologists, drug companies, um, for, because they are so quick. All right, because as soon as uh, you begin to make an immune response, the infection is almost over for the most part, especially those with a very short incubation period. And the virus has already spread. So if you can detect an immune response, it's too late. You have to try and detect it by other means. So it makes it very difficult to diagnose an acute infection. And as soon as you do, it's too late. And that means it's hard to control in large populations. And in particular, these kinds of situations, um, which, many of which have proliferated in the last 50 years. Um, so daycare centers are a modern development. And uh, in these situations, the others as well, a lot of people are put together. 
So you can have explosive spread of an infection because by the time you detect it, even if you look for symptoms, let's say you have a daycare center and everyone starts getting diarrhea, it's too late because if they have diarrhea, they've already been incubating for whatever the incubation period is and then it's most likely spread to other people. So acute infection is, is problematic for that reason. And we often see uh, contemporary explosive spread of infections, influenza of course, but norovirus or rotavirus gastroenteritis in populations such as these. Uh, as we'll see in a couple of lectures, we do have some antiviral drugs that can be used to treat acute infections. One of the main reasons we don't have more is because we can't detect them quickly enough. So if you s rely solely on symptoms, by the time you have symptoms, say, of a common cold, it is too late to treat it with an antiviral drug. So until we have rapid diagnostics, we're not going to have a lot of drugs. We can make antiviral drugs easily, but there's no point in making them if, if they're not useful. So the problem is you have to give these drugs very quickly. And an example is Tamiflu, which is an antiviral used against influenza. When you first, first feel your symptoms of flu, and you can tell that first hour when you get the flu-like symptoms, if you don't go getting your Tamiflu within two days, you, it's not going to be of any use. 48 hours is the window. The sooner the better. So you have to go to a physician and get a prescription. And most people don't bother to do that. What is it that Tamiflu does that allows you to take it with after you have even onset symptoms that limits the effect? Of well, it would be best if you took it um, before you had symptoms. Right. So in this case, it, it ameliorates, it shortens the disease, but it doesn't eliminate it completely. And that's what because is, you're what late. Is it doing to it's itself? inhibiting virus replication. It's inhibiting one of the viral enzymes. We will talk about that in a lot of detail. Yeah. Um, so if we had rapid diagnostics, um, you could screen populations uh, routinely uh, and, and then perhaps give antivirals earlier. But it's a problem because if you're healthy, you're not going to be screened for things and you always have to have a symptom. As I said before, maybe I, I didn't say it here, but I think one day we are going to have mirrors in our homes that will screen us in the morning and say, you're pathogen free today. Have a nice day. And that's it. You go on. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then the next morning you say, I detect rhinovirus. Uh, please proceed further and they'll give you instructions what to do. I, I think that is the way we're going to be able to control infections. It's not unreasonable that we can do that. It's a mirror on the wall. That's right. That's very good. Okay, acute uh, infections are defended against just like uh, others and we've talked about a little bit about defenses. We have innate responses which are really important. Uh, of course initially as these viruses get in uh, they inform the adaptive response of what's going on, the adaptive responses kick in later. Um, and those are really what clears the infection. In most cases, uh, a cellular response, a T cell response will, will clear the infection. Um, but the, and the antibodies are really late most of the time. They are going to protect you next time, most likely, uh, with the memory response. Immunocompromised individuals can have disastrous outcomes of acute infections. You and I, if we have healthy immune systems, we can clear most of them, but even the simplest cold can wipe out a, an immunocompromised person. So these are people with either lacking all, all cell, cells of the immune response, B cells and uh, T cells, or one or the other. Uh, the infection also provides memory, as we know. Uh, you, many of these acute infections only happen once. You get memory and then you have antibody memory which will then kick in very quickly and limit the infection and really prevent the development of symptoms. So we use vaccines to take advantage of this um, and um, it's, very, it's been very useful for a lot of infections but as you've probably heard before uh, there is antigenic variation in influenza and that can bypass uh, a good vaccine. Yes? Well, you do, pr it depends on the virus and the vaccine, but in, most, in many cases, you probably do have some replication, but not enough to give you symptoms. All right, so 
if you have um, a polio vaccine, especially the injected polio vaccine, it gives you antibodies in your blood. That does not prevent the virus from replicating in your intestine and being shed and then entering your blood, but that doesn't cause any symptoms. It's only when the virus gets in the blood that it's neutralized. So that's an extreme case because the site of immunity is pretty distant from where the virus comes in. But in most cases, you probably have a bit of uh, virus replication before the antibody response kicks in, but it doesn't cause any symptoms. All right, so I thought the best way to illustrate acute infections is to go through some specific examples and talk about them. So we're going to go through a number of viruses, influenza virus, polio, measles, rotavirus, and West Nile virus, and just talk about how these work. And this will give you a great uh, sampling of how acute infections work. Flu, of course, is enveloped, um, as is measles and West Nile. Uh, rotavirus and polio are non-enveloped uh, particles. And these are all RNA viruses, you'll notice. Okay, influenza, three types, A, B, and C. Uh, when you get a vaccine, the vaccine always has an A and a B type. All the news about influenza concerns influenza A. Pandemic strains are only influenza A strains. Um, the influenza A strains undergo the most variation uh, and cause the most disease. The influenza C types cause mostly inapparent or very mild upper tract illness. So if you get a common cold, it could be influenza C. So we don't, Im we don't immunize against inf influenza C because it's not a sufficiently serious pathogen. But influenza A and B can be debilitating. It can knock you out for two weeks, and, so, and it can kill you, of course. So we do want to have a vaccine against that. Antigenic variation, which you heard a bit about last time, is a big problem with uh, influenza and particularly influenza A. And so this makes, us, makes it necessary to have a vaccine, a new vaccine, almost every year. And we will talk about that in more detail when we talk about vaccines. So influenza virus enters your respiratory tract. You inhale droplets or you contaminate yourself. It replicates in the upper respiratory tract in the respiratory mucosa and eventually spreads down into the lower tract. So it can be restricted to just the upper tract. In fact, it can cause a common cold-like syndrome, or it can spread deeper. And when it does spread deeper, that, that makes you feel very sick. So the virus typically replicates all the way down to the trachea. It can go lower, and it's, then it gets very serious because it becomes pneumonia. But most of the time, it remains in the trachea, and you get what is called a substernal burning or pain because the virus is replicating there. You have a very severe cough. And this distinguishes it from the common cold. But the, the infection is limited, in humans at least, to the respiratory mucosa. It doesn't spread systemically. So as I said, the transmission is by droplets that are produced by coughing and sneezing and talking, but also by touching a contaminated surface. Uh, so you can, if you have flu and you're touching your face, which people do many times per hour, and then you shortly thereafter touch someone else, they could then transfer the virus to their nose uh, or their mouth or even their eyes and that will initiate an infection. So you have both aerosol and contact mechanisms of spread of this virus. Uncomplicated influenza, that means you recover relatively quickly and have no sequelae. The incubation period is one to five days. It's variable. Depends on how much virus you inoculate yourself. If you get if you're right in front of someone who sneezes and you get a huge inoculum, the incubation period will be shorter. And of course, also how healthy your immune system is. And the symptoms come on very quickly. People can usually, as I said, identify the exact hour when they started feeling bad and it turned out to be flu. Headache, chills, dry cough. Eventually you get a high fever, muscle aches, laziness or tiredness. You don't feel like eating. Uh, you get a fever that peaks within a, a day, 38 to 40 degrees centigrade, and then it slowly starts to go down, gone by day six. So the fever is gone by day six, but you can feel bad for about two weeks. So this is typical uncomplicated flu. It can differ in children or in, in older people. It can be, have different symptoms, can be more serious and even lethal in the very young and the very old. 
as the fever goes down, interestingly, your respiratory symptoms get worse. Uh, you, have, you start to have a productive cough. You cough up mucus because your respiratory tract is trying to clear the infection. So the, muc the, the ciliated mucus elevator is, come, is bringing up mucus. And you can cough and feel really bad for almost two weeks. So flu can really knock you out as opposed to a common cold. And this virus in humans replicates, as I said, the upper and lower tract because the receptors for the virus are present throughout the tract. If you may remember, the receptors for human strains of flu are alpha-2,6 linked sialic acids. We have those present throughout our tract. And avian strains use a different receptor, alpha-2,3 linked sialic acids. And we will talk about the, the consequences of that a bit later. How do you diagnose it? Uh, this is one of the few respiratory illnesses that we attempt to diagnose because we do have antivirals uh, and so there is some attempt to diagnose to make sure you're giving the antivirals to the right people but actually it turns out that in a flu season from November to March here in the in the temperate areas of the world if you go to a physician with flu-like symptoms he or she will just prescribe Tamiflu without giving a, a lab test all right, because it's the season and you probably have flu. Maybe you have a 50% probability of having flu. So the, how you diagnose it, it's called influenza-like illness. High fever, cough, or sore throat. That's it. You go to a doctor with those symptoms, you're going to probably get Tamiflu in the flu season. Uh, this other, no other non known cause. Of course, if it's known that you have some other type of infection, then uh, it, it, it may rule out influenza. Um, but that's often not the case. There are rapid lab tests. You can go to a physician and they will um, take some sputum and put it onto a little dipstick type test and it can tell you rapidly 10, 20 minutes whether you have antigen, but the accuracy is really bad. They're about 50% wrong half of the time. So that's why physicians will just prescribe the drug uh, based on your symptoms in the time of year. So here are a couple of interesting uh, curves to give you an idea of uh, what happens in people that have flu. These are actually from volunteers who were given uh, influenza. You can do this with this virus. You can actually infect people because you can, have, you can identify strains that are not terribly virulent and you can give this to people. And if you have a vaccine or, or an antiviral around in case things get out of hand, you can give it to them. Not a, not a vaccine. That would be too late. So here on the upper, upper left uh, graph, we've, people were given virus, it's just squirted into your nose with a little syringe without the needle on it, right? Just the syringe, you put it, you squirt it up. And then um, you come in periodically and um, they ask you how you feel. <laughs> so they make a symptom score, they ask you a bunch of questions and they make a symptom score and that's the white circles. And then they can uh, take a little swab of your nose and see how much virus is there. So it's an assay virus. So you can see um, the virus shedding is a little bit, uh, maybe, it's the same, is it the same here? I think it's the same at the first signs of symptoms right here. There's virus present there and here. And the symptoms go on a little bit longer. Then they decline as the virus uh, declines as well. So what this means is that there's a, not a, um, a long period of shedding before you feel bad. Okay, if you, if you were okay for five days and you're shedding virus for five days, that would mean you could more easily spread it to other people. Uh, here's an older study where we're looking at a variety of things. We're looking in the same kind of test where you give virus to people and you measure different things. We're measuring virus in nasopharyngeal wash. So you can see it peaks very quickly, a couple days after administration, then goes down. Uh, we have a peak of interferon, which probably helps to clear the, the infection. Uh, and then we have um, antibodies here of various sorts. Um, and you can see they're not going up till really uh, most of the virus replication is done. So these are antibodies coming up quite late. So probably they're minimally contributing to your recovery. Um, probably what's more important is a combination of the innate response. And I think cellular responses are earlier uh, to flu as well. But of course, you're going to have memory, uh, antibody memory, B cell memory after this. So the next time you get infected, if it's the same strain, you'll make antibodies really quickly and, and actually prevent uh, a robust infection. Now, flu is a seasonal disease everywhere, pretty much. Depends where you are here in the temperate uh, zone. It occurs in the winter, as I said, from November to March is the flu season. So it's really, 
It's over in a day or two, although you know, there can be flexibility. So this is a, a summary of outbreaks or, or seasonal flu of the last, from 2004, 5, 6, and 7 seasons. There is a global network of laboratories organized by the World Health Organization. They're called National Reference Labs. Every country has a bunch of them, and they get samples and from physicians and clinics, and they, in the flu season, they, they look for influenza virus by a variety of, of diagnostic techniques, and they can actually type them as uh, A or B and different kinds of, of A as well. You can see there's a very nice peak of flu activity every year from November to March. Um, it varies, the number of cases varies each year. Uh, most of these are flu A, so unsubtyped flu A is the yellow, so you can see that constitutes most of the infection. The green is influenza B, so it, far fewer infections are diagnosed. Okay, so again, very, very consistent um, seasonal flu. So this is seasonal influenza. This is mostly the same strain. In this case, it's H3N2 and H1N1 that are coming up every year. Now, uh, if you're interested in this year's season, it's a, been a mild flu season. Anybody have flu this year? That's right, I know you had flu. Or you th it was influenza-like illness, right? We don't know if it was flu. Nobody else had flu? Okay. What about all those people that didn't want to take the exam because they had flu? Oh, that was some other class, okay. <laughs> so here we have uh, 2011, week 40. So that is um, October, I believe. So here is November, December. So in December, is, we start to get a little activity. This is, again, the different, this is the total number of, of um, positive, or the percent positive. This is the total number of specimens they looked at, and the percent positive is the line, and then the, this, the different kinds of flu. And you can see it had a nice peak here. Uh, this is week 10, which would be February, right? And then it starts to go down. So that's the last sampling that we have. You, there's a very nice CDC website where you can find this uh, every week. So I would guess that it's going to keep going down. You know, the weather got warm pretty early this year, and that probably restricts transmission. But now it's cold again, so who knows, might have a little, a little peak, we'll see. But this is pretty mild, the number, the, the percent positive, the total number of cases is pretty low this year. I have no idea why, nobody understands this. Now some years we have anomalies, we have pandemic years where we have a brand new strain emerging, and we'll talk a bit later how that happens, but uh, in 29, 2009 we had a new influenza strain emerge, so the, the Last one, the new strain to emerge before that was in 1977. And since 1977, we just had seasonal uh, influenza of the kind that I showed you. But in 2009, here's week 20, there was um, an emergence of a new strain. So week 20, there shouldn't be any flu in, in the US. All right, but you can see there was quite a bit of flu. There was a peak in uh, April, and then it went down, but it didn't go away, so there were cases throughout throughout the spring and then there was a peak around week 45 in the fall so you see it did continue over the summer peak in week 45 and then uh, by week 50 of 2009 that was the end of it and there was no flu really very little flu season in the beginning of 2010 yes is the new strain related to changes or is it completely separate? so this new strain was totally new it didn't emerge by drifting so in other words the, during the seasonal outbreaks every year the, the strain varies slightly antigenically, one or two amino acids, so that's drift. This is an example of shift. We have a totally new strain. And this one probably came from pigs, uh, and it, we will talk about how it emerged, but these viruses infect many animals, and they probably are incubators for the generation of, of new reassortants. So this was a brand new strain, and that's why uh, most of the world didn't have immunity to it, so it caused a pandemic. Yes? This is a good question. We, we really don't understand because in this case, the, the virus probably emerged in pigs that are used for food production. There's so many, many places in the world with ha where that happens. And we don't really monitor every pig every day, so you're going to miss the emergence. And this one is believed to have emerged in a pig in Mexico. That's where all the epidemiology says. But, and we can tell what the parents were. Uh, we know what the gene assortment is. 
but we can't, we can't say exactly what happened to make it able to jump into people because we don't know the immediate precursor, right? It's gone from the pig. Um, so it's, it's a lot of detective work and supposition, but we do know that it came from a pig because all the gene segments can be shown to be in the pig population. We'll talk about that more later. It's a really interesting problem. Here are some statistics just to give you an idea. This is a really serious disease. We have 30 to 50 million cases a year, just seasonal flu, and you can have between 3,000 and 49,000 deaths. It depends on the year. This is an average, or this is a range of the past 31 years of flu. So that's a lot of people dying. Uh, and so that's why one of the reasons we vaccinate. And that's why it's really, uh, I, I don't understand why people always say, I don't need to get flu vaccine because I never get flu. But what if you got it and you died? So you might as well prevent that. So that's, that's quite a big number. Maybe. Maybe? I don't know. Okay. All right. So uh, one of the reasons flu is bad is because it damages your lungs. And in fact, the people who die often get pneumonia. Uh, and um, the damage in the lung is probably a combination of direct virus killing. It's a cytolytic or cytopathic virus. And there's a big immune response to this virus, including a lot of cytokines. So both of those cause tissue damage. And just as an example of that, this is a lung of a mouse infected with influenza. This is a normal lung, section of normal lung. It's mostly air down in the lower lungs, uh, as you would expect. But then here is an example of a flu-infected mouse. There's a lot of inflammation. There's immune cells in here, all these dark staining dots. Those are immune cells coming in, trying to clear the infection. There's tissue swelling, you can see, by the more staining area. So the tissues swell. Uh, because of the permeability of the capillaries caused by the cytokines, and that shrinks the airway passages and can restrict your breathing. So that's part of the problem with uh, viral pneumonia. And in this uh, paper, what they did was to use an inhibitor, a chemical inhibitor of cytotoxic T cells, and they treated the mice with this at the time of infection. And you can see that there's less lung pathology uh, compared to the untreated mouse when you inhibit cytotoxic T cells. So this suggests that a lot of the damage is being caused by CTLs, either directly by cell killing or maybe by uh, releasing cytokines that cause the inflammation. So a lot of work is going into this to try and understand the basis for this pathology so that we might be able to prevent it. Uh, here are some complications. You can get pneumonia, primary viral pneumonia, which means the virus goes down into your alveoli and compromises your ability to breathe. You can get secondary bacterial pneumonia. So people start to recover from influenza and all of a sudden they have bacterial colonization in their lungs, strep pneumonia, for example, and you can die of that as well. Uh, myositis, there's, there can be cardiac involvement, cardiac symptoms, not virus replicating in the lung, but probably the cytokines produced by infection causing uh, problems in the heart. And there's also a syndrome called RISE syndrome, which is a kind of paralysis, uh, which is, uh, sorry, it's a kind of encephalopathy, and, uh, a disease of the brain, and a uh, problem with the liver function, which seems to be related to uh, infection. Uh, the in interventions include non-pharmaceutical things, all well, the garbage you could buy at a drugstore to make you feel better, but really doesn't impact on virus replication at all. You can take antivirals. There are three that have two different targets. Two target the neuraminidase, one targets the ion channel in the virus particle. And we'll talk about these more. And then there's a vaccine, which is really the best way to prevent uh, infection. We have good vaccines. Okay, so that's flu. That's an acute infection of substantial medical uh, relevance. Let's talk about polio. Polio is a non-enveloped RNA virus, has an icosahedral structure, as you recall, and it's, it contains a plus-stranded uh, RNA molecule. The way the virus causes disease is you ingest it. It goes into your alimentary tract and replicates in the mucosal surface. The virus binds to mucosal layers, it replicates in them, gets across the basement membrane, it induces inflammation, it crosses the basement membrane, gets into the subepithelial tissues, enters the circulatory system, and then causes a viremia. There's a primary and a secondary viremia, and in 99% of infections, that's it, nothing else happens. You may have nonspecific symptoms of virus infection, right, fever, malaise, etc., muscle aches. Only in 1% of infections does the virus get into this, this central nervous system. 
and there it kills motor neurons. The virus replicates in motor neurons, it destroys them, and if you destroy enough motor neurons, you can't move whatever muscle is innervated by that part of the brain or spinal cord. So the virus probably goes from the blood into the muscle, gets into the ends, ends of nerves in the muscle, and spreads into the spinal cord, and then eventually into the brain. So here, for example, the virus can replicate in this body of this spinal cord. It will destroy it. It will spread within the cord, and then eventually destroying enough neurons so you get uh, paralysis of the limb. So in my lab in 1980, late 1980s, um, we made a mouse model for this disease. So polio is a specifically human infection. There's no other animal in nature that we know to be infected by polio. And until uh, we did this work, you could only study the pathogenesis of polio in monkeys. So when I came here, I thought I would like to make a mouse model uh, for polio infection. So what we did is we cloned the receptor gene for the, re for the virus, which we've talked about a little. And then we made transgenic mice containing the gene encoding the human receptor. So if you take a mouse, a wild type mouse, and you put huge amounts of polio into it, nothing happens because there's no receptor for the virus on the surface of mouse cells. However, people had known for years that if you take cultured mouse cells and put the viral RNA into them, the viral RNA will initiate infection. So that means the cells are permissive, right? Is that the right word? I forgot your first part of the course. They're permissive. You can put viral RNA in the cells and they will, the virus will replicate. But they're not susceptible because they don't have receptors. All right. So we figured if we put the receptor in by transgene, the, cell, the mice would be susceptible. And in fact, amazingly, that worked. The transgenic mice expressing the human receptor, you can infect them with polio, they get paralyzed, as you can see here. So we and many other people have used this to study the disease. In fact, for years, the vaccines were tested in monkeys. So now people test them in these kinds of mice. Um, so it's been a really useful model uh, to, to do a number of things with polio. So here's one of the things you can see. If you take uh, this, this mouse from the previous slide with a paralyzed hind limb, uh, perhaps two or three days after infection, depending on how much virus you give them, you section the spinal cord of this animal and you can stain for viral RNA. And that's what all these green dots are here. So we're staining for virus RNA, that, that is, we're looking to see where the virus is replicating. And you can see that it's replicating in neurons. How do I know these are neurons? They're big and, and triangular shaped. They're very, very uh, distinct morphology. And no other cell types the virus replicates in. And none of the other cells, in fact, have the receptor for the virus. So that's why we think it's a neuron-specific infection. You can also see a lot of darkly staining cells. This is section is stained with hematoxylin and eosin and you can see these darkly staining cells are probably inflammatory cells some sort of macrophage or lymphocyte coming in trying to uh, clear the infection so as i said if you get enough replication and destruction of neurons you will get paralysis so here's a very neat uh, time course of polio from a 1958 textbook of medicine so this is not in medical textbooks anymore because we don't have the disease in the US. There's no point in teaching medical students about it. In fact, if you become a physician and you saw a case of polio, you would probably not be able to diagnose it. This happens occasionally in the US. There was recently some polio in Minnesota, and it took a long time for them to figure out that it was polio. So here we have a wonderful time course of what happens in a person after exposure to the virus right here. We have um, temperature, clinical signs. So look at this. You have um, a little spike of temperature about seven days after infection. Then the temperature goes back down. And then in a few individuals, one out of 100 later, you have a, a greater spike in temperature at about day 14 or 13. And that corresponds with neurological symptoms. So in this individual, the virus has gotten into the CNS, and it's replicating there. So here you have initially the person as well, headaches, sore throat, nausea, you know, nonspecific infection signs, and then headache and nausea and eventually stiffness, pain in the muscle and paralysis, very specific for the virus. Uh, here we have virus in various places, virus and throat secretions. 
virus in feces. Look how long this is shed, Th 30 days or more. Now, if you don't have neurological symptoms, you wouldn't be suspected of having polio. So you're walking around and you're shedding virus, and that's why the virus spreads so well, because uh, th these people don't have any neurological signs. Also, there's virus in your throat for a good period, so you could presumably uh, cough it out and spread it to someone that way. Here we have virus in the blood. So you see this little period when you have virus in the blood and then uh, goes away. Here's the antibody, which is very late, coming up. And then finally in the bottom, virus in the central nervous system. So you can see it doesn't start coming up until about day 10. And this is, again, only in people that get paralysis. The, most of the time, the virus doesn't get in there, and so you don't have CNS replication. So this is an acute infection. It happens relatively quickly, and it's cleared. Now, these individuals where virus is paralyzing them, they have residual limb paralysis, which in many cases can be uh, accommodated by physical therapy. So many individuals restore, regain function of limbs even after uh, polio paralysis, but not everyone. So we're the only known reservoir. It's spread by fecal-oral transmission. So we shed virus in the feces, and someone picks it up by contamination. In the US, when polio was common, it happened in the summer, and it mainly targeted kids. And we, we feel that uh, the kids somehow had poor hand hygiene and, and spread it to one another. To this day, we're really not sure uh, how that occurs. As I said, it peaks in the warm months here in the temperate climates, the summer. When there were big outbreaks of polio in the U.S., parents wanted to keep their kids inside so that they couldn't go out and play and get polio. There is an interesting complication called post-polio syndrome. Uh, this is, happens in someone who has been paralyzed with polio, and they typically can recover their limb function. Then 30 or 40 years later, they start to get paralyzed again. They, many of them end up being in wheelchairs because they can't walk, and this is called post-polio. It's 25 to 40 percent of people who have had polio have this syndrome. And for many years, people thought it might be an infectious process. They said, well, maybe the virus is somehow persisting in the CNS all these years and then gets reactivated. But that's not the case. There's no evidence that polio persists. It's an acute virus that comes and goes. I think what post-polio is, when you age, you normally lose neuron function. Neurons die normally, and you have a good supply of neurons so that you can uh, handle that. But if you've had polio, that reserve is gone. You've lost a lot of neurons, and so as you age, you develop paralysis again because you don't have a backup. In the U.S., there's really no more polio. Uh, there used to be 20 to 30,000 cases a year of paralytic polio. Just think now, 20 to 30,000 cases of paralytic and only one in 100 cases are paralytic. So there are a lot of infections in the US, and that's why the disease spread so efficiently. Uh, we introduced an inactivated vaccine in 1954, a live infectious vaccine in 1962. In the last case of wild-type polio, which we call indigenous polio, this, the virus that's circulating in your country was in uh, 1979. So the only polio uh, now is occasionally vaccine-related, which we'll talk about later. So this is the map of polio, the, the what's remaining of polio globally. I just downloaded this the other day. This is from WHO. Uh, there are three countries with endemic polio. It's never been eradicated. Um, Nigeria, uh, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. India used to be on this slide. Every year, I would have India on this slide. And this year, the past year, is the first time there has not been a single case of polio in India, which is amazing because it's been really, really hard. But you see, well, here in, in Nigeria, uh, the virus has spread into neighboring Chad. Okay, Chad used to be polio-free. It goes across borders because viruses don't respect borders. And the same thing... <laughs> So the same thing will probably happen in India unless they are very vigilant. They have to keep vaccinating and covering everyone. And the problem is when you've eradicated the disease, people get complacent. So, you know, families say, I don't have to get vaccinated. There's no more polio. And the public health officials even may get complacent. You have to be really vigilant for a long time until it's eradicated here. And it's really hard to eradicate in Pakistan and Afghanistan because 
As you know, there's social conflict, there's war, and you can't immunize everyone when that happens. But look at the numbers, though. It's really good. 2011 total global cases, 650. So this is reported confirmed paralytic cases. There used to be over half a million cases a year in the 1980s. So this is really an amazing uh, accomplishment. Um, this year so far 31 cases and, and last year at the same time there were 67 so maybe there'll be less it's hard to tell so it's really an amazing uh, accomplishment of course the goal is to eradicate it I don't know when that'll happen <clears throat> our next virus is measles which is a very different agent it's a paramyxovirus it's an enveloped negative strand RNA containing virus one of the most contagious human viruses the, there is a number that we use when we quantify how many people can be infected from one person to, an, w to others with a virus. It's called the R0. And, you know, so an R0 of one means if I'm infected, I can infect one other person. But measles has an R0 of 15 to 20. So it's quite infectious. And it also requires large populations to maintain the virus. So small island populations don't get uh, measles typically. That's what the virus looks like, enveloped RNA, uh, nucleocapsid, it's an electron microscope here, negative strand RNA. One serotype, you get infected, you're immune for life, so that's good. It's transmitted by respiratory secretions, coughing, sneezing, talking, hand contact. And there's a couple of days before you get a rash where you are shedding virus. So this is a little more than flu, if you remember. There are a couple of days extra where you can infect other people because it's not clear that you have measles. And almost everyone shows sign of disease. So this is not like polio where one in a hundred get neurological symptoms. Here, everybody gets the rash or almost everyone. So the infection starts when you inhale droplets containing virus. It replicates, uh, well, it actually doesn't replicate in the respiratory epithelium, yes. No, all well, it means is that there's just one serotype circulating globally, and if you make antibodies against that, you will never be infected again because there's no other serotype around to infect you. With polio, there are three. So unless you're immunized against all three, you will get infected with one of the other two. Okay. And this is in contrast to rhinovirus. Does anyone know how many serotypes of rhinoviruses there are? Sorry? Yeah, they're over 100, probably 200. And that's why it's hard to make a vaccine. That's why you get a cold every year. So, all right, so the virus gets through your mucosal surface. I'm gonna tell you how it does that in a minute. Gets into your blood through the lymph system, uh, replicates in other organs, particularly lymphoid organs. So this virus is, is tropic for lymphoid cells, uh, macrophages, lymphocytes. There's a secondary viremia that spreads the virus to the skin. That's how you get the rash. And it can go to some other sites and cause complications. It can cause encephalitis, a brain infection, or a very late neurological sequelae. 30 to 40 years after you get infected, you can get this neurological degeneration called SSPE, and uh, it's caused by measles. This is uniformly fatal, very rare, but uniformly fatal. So if you immunize, you prevent all of this from happening. So let me tell you how the virus gets in. This is very interesting. In every case, I've told you, virus binds to the respiratory epithelium, uh, replicates in those cells, and then gets below, right? It's not the case for measles. Measles replicates in immune cells in your lung. So they're not shown on this picture. But say a, a macrophage or some kind of a lymphoid cell uh, is actually where the virus enters and replicates in those. And those cells then cross the respiratory epithelium. Now remember, uh, Immune cells have a really good ability to cross tight junctions to get through basement membranes. So they bring the virus into your subepithelial tissues. So this is different from what we've talked about for most other mucosal infections. The virus is coming in in an immune cell. So then that immune cell brings the virus into you. It spreads it to other immune cells where it replicates and eventually uh, causes the skin rash. I think I have a slide showing that here. So here we have your inhaling virus. 
and in your lung it is replicating an immune cell. So here's your respiratory epithelium. Um, it is replicating in uh, lymphoid cells which are shown here in orange and they, those bring the virus inside of you and then those infected cells deliver the virus to lymph nodes or other immune tissues like spleen and you get an amplification of virus that brings it to your skin and you get the rash but remember you have to transmit it this is a really cool part of this story you have to transmit the virus so normally I would say uh, yeah the respiratory epithelium is infected so not only is virus getting below but it's also coming out the apical side and then you cough and you cough out the virus but the virus doesn't replicate in the epithelium so how does it get out so just in the past year it was discovered that um, there is a new re a second receptor for the virus on the basal lateral surface of your respiratory epithelium so the virus comes back to the respiratory tract through these lymphoid cells it binds to the bottom of the epithelium gets in the cell replicates and then comes out the top okay so that's really interesting that the virus has this exit strategy wherein it gets in the cell in the bottom and then comes out the top so here's a little timeline of all this, uh, just to give you a sense for what's going on when the start infection is here. We have our incubation period of about seven to eight days. Uh, and that time there was a primary and secondary viremia happening. Uh, the prodromal phase, again, this is when you have nonspecific symptoms of infection, the fever, aches, et cetera. Uh, and then, um, eventually you have the rash at about day 14 and at that time you start to make antibody and eventually you recover and again healthy people recover from this infection for the most part you see virus shedding happens before the rash and as I said a couple of days before the rash so there's this period when you're highly infectious and you can spread it to other people because you're not kept at home because no one thinks you have measles and you can infect everyone else so that's why it spreads readily say in a school population uh, uncomplicated measles fever you have respiratory symptoms does anyone know what coryza is it's a respiratory symptom okay. <laughs> what else besides cough is a respiratory symptom yeah, yeah it's runny nose right uh, coryza is a medical term for runny nose there's a medical term for everything and some of them you've never heard of, and this is one of them, coryza. Cough, sometimes conjunctivitis, infection of the eye. Coplic spots, um, those are white spots uh, in the mucous membranes of the mouth. You can't see them very well, but they're right there. This happens before the skin rash, so this used to be diagnostic. This doesn't really happen for any other kind of virus infection. So if your kid was feverish and achy, you brought him or her to the physician, you could look in the mouth, and say, yep, you got measles stay home that would be good if, if you in fact did that and then the rash goes from the, the face to all the extremities as shown here so that's virus replicating uh, in skin cells complications encephalitis one in a thousand so this can be serious you can have neurological sequelae pneumonia which is never good ear infection you can die one or two per thousand in, in developed countries die from measles so that's that's a lot it's quite a bit if you're in a country with poor nutrition the fatality rate can be 28 percent so that's the other day I mentioned how nutrition can affect uh, infection and this is one of the ways SSPE is this late sequelae 30 to 40 years later after infection uh, and in, in addition to poor nutrition uh, in the third in third world countries you well you always get immunosuppression with measles if you remember back to one of our other lectures we talked about how the virus does this um, in developed countries this is not an issue because there are not that many infections that are that are lethal but in third world children who are not only m poorly nourished but they're uh, immunosuppressed they're susceptible to a lot of other infections par parasitic infections for example uh, tuberculosis so this can be a really bad story so in the US before vaccines we used to have three to four million cases of measles a year uh, four to five hundred deaths, 48,000 hospitalizations, a thousand people a year, kids with chronic disabilities due to encephalitis, virus getting in the brain. So we made 
a vaccine to stop this. This is not acceptable. We can make a vaccine that prevents infection. Therefore, these kinds of consequences are not acceptable. So we stopped endemic transmission in the year 2000. The vaccine is measles, mumps, rubella, MMR. Unfortunately, in 1998, an English uh, gastroenterologist named Andrew Wakefield reported that this vaccine caused autism. He was wrong. His data were wrong. It's since been retracted, but as a consequence, many people are afraid of this vaccine. And so you get outbreaks in many countries. There have been outbreaks in the UK and Ireland of measles and under-vaccinated kids, and these viruses spread to the US. So we have about 200 cases a year of measles in the US, which are imported and in people who are not immunized because their parents think that the MMR vaccine causes uh, autism, which it does not. And some of these kids die of measles encephalitis or measles pneumonia. So again, this is a completely preventable vaccine. The vaccine, uh, sorry, it's a completely preventable disease. The vaccine is absolutely safe and everyone should be immunized. Now, um, in the US, you can see when we licensed the vaccine uh, in the 60s, there was a precipitous drop in the number of infections accompanied by a drop in the measles death per year. We're going from 700 down to none. And now, again, the only measles we have is in unvaccinated kids and the virus is imported. Uh, globally, there are still many countries with measles because we can't get vaccine to them or uh, there's not complete coverage. So here is a, a chart uh, showing the number of measles cases. Here, the darkest colors, more than 1,000 countries, uh, sorry, more than 1,000 cases of measles in nine countries of the world, you can see. And even uh, the U.S., with our 200 here, we're in red. Uh, so we really um, could get rid of all this. There's no reason to have it. It's just a lack of immunization. Now, one of the reasons is that WHO, which runs these immunization campaigns, is really stretched thin with its polio eradication program. And I was at a talk not too long ago where a WHO person said, we can't eradicate measles because we're still working on polio. But once that's done, we can turn our full attention uh, to measles as well. So probably this could be eradicated uh, eventually also. Okay, in one day uh, in the world, about 200 million people have gastroenteritis. And the water that these people pass as a result equals the amount of water passing over Victoria Falls in one minute. That's 65 million liters per minute, people with gastroenteritis. Most of this is viral gastroenteritis. It's a lot of water. Water passed in a 24 hour period. This is in a 24-hour period. 24 hours. This. So uh, Victoria Falls passes 65 million liters per minute. So in one minute, that's what, that's it's what uh, hours. yeah, it's the same as 24 hours. Either way, it's a lot of water. It's a lot of water. And if you don't replace it, you will die. All right? Now that's the bottom line. If you have gastroenteritis and diarrhea and you don't replace the fluids, you will die. Especially if you are very young, you will dehydrate more quickly. So the single most important cause of diarrheal illness as infants is rotavirus. 30 to 50% of all gastroenteritis in this age group is caused by these viruses discovered in 1973. Uh, these are viruses that occur in seven serogroups, which means sometimes, depending where you are in the world, you may need a different kind of vaccine to prevent it. And they infect many different animals besides people. They have a segmented double-stranded RNA genome. They are real viruses. Um, they infect everybody. And unless you've been immunized with the vaccine, you have all been infected at some point very early in your life. You probably had rotavirus gastroenteritis. Here in temperate climates, they peak in winter. It's also seasonal. And again, most common cause of childhood viral gastroenteritis, 25 million physician visits per year 2 million hospitalizations, 800,000 deaths. So this is a very expensive uh, vaccine and it can be lethal. These deaths are because the kids are not properly hydrated. And so if you're very severely gastro, have very severe gastroenteritis, you may have to have intravenous fluids and it may not be possible depending on where you are. So as in the US, everybody was infected by five years of age and one out of 70 kids got in the hospital because of this. In the developing world, as I've said, dehydration accounts for death in, in 5%. It's 5% of all deaths in, in uh, kids less than five years old. So this is a serious problem. Here's the global distribution of rota deaths. Each dot is 500 deaths. And you can see uh, the poorly developed or underdeveloped countries uh, have, have a lot of deaths. 
Uh, we have now, since the vaccine, very few rotavirus deaths in the U.S. As I said, rota is a real virus. It's, it has a double-stranded RNA genome, and the capsid is icosahedral, and it consists of two concentric shells. It's called rotavirus because when it was first discovered and seen in the EM, it looked like wheels, shown here. It's transmitted by fecal oral contamination. You uh, excrete virus and feces and that contaminates someone else. You need very few particles to initiate an infection. They have done volunteer studies, giving them different amounts of virions, and that's where this number comes from. As I said, if you're very young, you can die from dehydration. As you get older, you get reinfected, but you get milder and milder disease, presumably because you have antibodies. Yes? Did you just, did you say that yes. Would you like to be infected? With this? <laughs> no? How much do they get paid? Probably $300. <laughs> per liter of water <laughs> Per liter, no. It's a fixed fee. It's a fixed fee. Yeah, the, the certain infections, noroviruses is another you can get volunteers because it's benign enough. All you need to do here is if people have gastroenteritis, you give them fluids or intravenous fluids because if, you're, if you keep having gastroenteritis, whatever you drink just comes out. So uh, you can do that. And that's how we know a lot about the pathogenesis. 10 to the 8th to 10 to the 10th particles per ml of feces. It's a lot of virus, so that's why it's easily spread. And you only need 100 to infect someone. Contaminated hands, if you're working in a kitchen and you have, you can have asymptomatic infection or before you get symptoms or after you've recovered, you're still shedding virus. You don't wash your hands well. That's why they have signs in the restrooms. All employees must wash their hands because of rotavirus and norovirus. You can contaminate food and people will get ill. And they're also stable on environmental surfaces because uh, they are not enveloped. So physically, they're very stable particles. Fortunately, it's self-limiting, vomiting and diarrhea, a little bit of fever. As I said, asymptomatic infections can play a role for obvious reasons. Short incubation period, four to eight days of diarrhea. So if you can't drink in four to eight days, you will dehydrate. And if you're a baby, which is where most of the serious infections occur, you will die because you don't have much fluid to begin with. The virus is ingested, replicates in the intestinal mucosa and pretty much stays there, it doesn't set up a viremia, it doesn't go subepithelial. Um, and you shed it and at the same time the infection causes diarrhea. And this is just a staining of intestinal mucosa from probably one of these volunteers. They probably took a little biopsy and uh, stained it, did a section, stained it for uh, rotaviral antigen and you can see uh, cells in the villi expressing the viral proteins. Now, the diarrhea is probably multifactorial. The virus kills some uh, epithelial cells, which probably contributes. And you know, there's a big turnover of epithelium in the gut, so I'm not sure how, much, how important this is. The most important contributors to diarrhea, we've actually mentioned the NSP4 protein of this virus is an enterotoxin that probably causes the diarrhea. So here you can see NSP4 being made in an infected cell. Uh, that causes chloride to be excreted, and that causes the diarrhea. There's also an effect on calcium levels of NSP4, uh, and the elevated calcium also dis disrupts the tight junctions between cells, and that probably contributes to fluid imbalance as well. We uh, started out in 1998 with a vaccine called RotaShield. Now, the basis for this vaccine was a rotavirus, uh, a rhesus rotavirus. So rhesus rotaviruses are antigenically somewhat cross-reactive with human strains, but if you drink them, they don't cause disease. So they replicate in you and they give you an immune response to make you an immune to hum human strains. So what they did is they made a vaccine with these rhesus rotaviruses, and then they also made reassortants to, to include other human uh, seroantigens in the vaccine. So you can see the outer shell here is black or blue because these are reassortants that have some of the outer shell proteins of human strains on the backbone of the rhesus. So these uh, you drink, they replicate in you and they give you immunity but you don't get sick. Okay, but uh, unfortunately about a year after this was licensed it w its use was suspended because 
It was thought to be associated with a high rate of what's called intussusception. Intussusception happens when your small intestine uh, telescopes into the large intestines where they join, just by the appendix here. So that's called intussusception. This happens in kids with gastroenteritis uh, caused by rotaviruses. And the vaccinated kids seem to have a slightly elevated rate of intussusception. So they took this vaccine off the market. Um, now, and then two other vaccines were developed that have replaced it. Uh, one is called Rotatech. This is a reassortant between human and bovine strains. Again, so you get many different antigenic types. These don't cause disease in people because the animal strains generally don't do that. This is taken orally. And then Rotarix is a human isolate which was attenuated genetically. It was modified so that it wouldn't cause uh, gastroenteritis. So that's just one strain and it, again is taken uh, orally. Very interestingly, back in 2010, uh, people were deep sequencing these vaccines, among other vaccines, it was a study looking at 10 different viral vaccines. They deep sequenced it and they found that the vaccines were contaminated by a porcine circovirus. Now circoviruses are small, single-stranded DNA containing viruses. The reason they're in the vaccine, these are pig viruses. The vaccine is grown in cells which are trypsinized with trypsin, you know, to grow cells in culture, you have to trypsinize them to expand them. The trypsin is made from pig pancreas, and the pig pancreas has circoviruses in it. And no one knew this until they deep sequenced the vaccine. So for a little bit, this vaccine's distribution was suspended, but then it was re, uh, re it was, its use was initiated again when well, the clinical trial results were reviewed, it was decided that it wasn't problematic to have circovirus um, in this vaccine. But very interesting issues surrounding this. Should we have adventitious viruses in our vaccines or not? And our last virus is West Nile virus. Uh, first isolated in 1937 from Uganda, the West Nile district of Uganda. This has nothing to do with Egypt. It's Uganda, different country, but it's called West Nile virus. Was not present in the Western Hemisphere until 1999 when it came to New York City in August and started a little epidemic here in Queens and since then has spread to the rest of North America from that initial starting point in 1999. We think it came over on an airplane either in an infected mosquito or an infected person. We're not sure but um, the virus that started here in New York is probably identical to a isolate from an Israeli goose farm. All right, So it probably came from that farm to New York City infects lots of birds, lots of different kinds of mosquitoes, and other animals uh, as well. And here is a cartoon from the New Yorker. <laughs> We're pretty sure it's West Nile virus, and now you know why this is wrong, right? Because <laughs> it didn't come from Egypt. But it's funny anyway. Okay, West Nile virus is a flavivirus. It is an RNA, pus-stranded RNA virus that has an icosahedral shell surrounded by an envelope which in turn has these very interesting type 2 glycoproteins uh, embedded in it. The virus uh, has a transmission cycle Im involving mosquitoes and birds. So it's present in wild birds and the mosquitoes transfer it from one bird to another. Humans and horses and other mammals are dead ends because the virus goes into them, it replicates, but not enough so that a mosquito can pick it up and transmit it to another human. So the natural cycle of this infection is in birds and people, horses sometimes get infected. These are dead ends. So when it infects us, uh, it sometimes can cause disease. It's transmitted to us by a mosquito bite. It has a three to 14 day incubation period. Uh, 20 to 30% of people who are infected get a flu-like illness. It's called West Nile fever. And 80% have no symptoms. So 80% of the infections are asymptomatic. <clears throat> uh, one in 150 people develop neuroinvasive disease. The virus goes into your CNS and you can have all of these symptoms including polio-like flaccid paralysis. 10% mortality. Half of the people that undergo neuroinvasive disease have long-term uh, neurological sequelae. They don't recover. So it's not a good thing to get even though it's 80% asymptomatic, especially if you're older 
it's not good to get infected with uh, West Nile virus. When the mosquito, who has been feeding on infected birds, when it bites you, it delivers the virus to the subepithelial tissues. It gets taken up by dendritic cells, and the virus replicates in the dendritic cell. So this is now going to be spread to lymph nodes and other sites by infected dendritic cells. And that, those DCs bring virus to other organs where there are lymphoid cells that the virus likes to replicate in, like spleen and so forth. Now, as you know, you get an innate response to infection. You get um, cytokines produced, and the TNF alpha permeabilizes the blood-brain barrier and lets the virus get across it. And that's why we have a number of infections with neurological sequelae. The virus gets into the brain, it in induces an immune response there, and that is the reason why we have neurological symptoms. Here's a chart of cases in the US. So in 1999, the virus was introduced. Uh, not too much activity until 2002 began to spread across the country. These are total cases in black. So in 2002, 4,000 total cases. And over half of those had neurological sequelae. And you can see that percentage varies for, for different years. In 23, we had 10,000 cases, but the same number of neurological ones. And more recently, the numbers are lower. This is the case fatality rate according to age. So the case fatality rate is if you have a confirmed case of West Nile infection, what fraction of those individuals die? All right, confirmed case, how many die? Uh, the age group, zero to nine, you can see it's very low. And as you get older, 50 to 59, 60, greater than 70, it goes up. So again, this is more severe. The encephalitis, which is causing the case fatality, uh, or the fatality is higher in, in older people. It, it is in every state in the U.S. So it started in New York City and spread all over the U.S. It's in Mexico. It's in uh, Canada. Uh, the numbers differ according to the year. When there are drought years, the numbers are higher. In drought years, mosquitoes don't feed on birds as often, and they tend to, to feed on people and infect them. Uh, you can see the numbers here. Some years, there are lots of cases. California has uh, very many cases. Texas often has a lot. Other states have very few, uh, like Oregon. But this is all spread uh, from birds to people by mosquitoes. Some vaccines are under development at the moment. Uh, because, as I said, you don't want to get encephalitis, especially if you're older. Uh, but they're not going to be ready for a while. So in the meantime, the best way to control this is by vector control. And so there are many ways to do that. But if you are in areas in the summer when there are mosquitoes around, you should be careful. You should use repellent, uh, especially if it's a dry year and the mosquitoes are likely to be carrying West Nile virus. Uh, and you should use window screens, of course, and, and do other things. Avoid standing water. Try to eliminate standing water. In many states, there are uh, very specific West Nile uh, elimination programs. Almost every state has a program to reduce standing water and eliminate mosquitoes that are known to be carriers of West Nile. So don't let the 80% asymptomatic rate fool you, because if this virus gets in your, your brain, it can cause problems. <laughs>